Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Opportunity Knox. This is, I am your host, the Rev Raw. This week, this special episode is Voting 2018. Before we get started on tonight's conversation, we just want to throw out a subtle disclaimer. Mystical Ministry, Opportunity Knox, The Sacred Space, as well as our hosting location, Chica, are a nonpartisan um, organizations. We do not support any specific candidates, organizations, or PACs during this podcast. We are coming to you as people, as citizens, with our own um, takes on the props and measures that are put out there for us. Tonight, I have three special guests. We have our returning, might as well say, co-host, Mary Valdemar, or Mary B. Hey, what's up, y'all? Jason, will you introduce yourself? What's good? Um, Jason Martinez. Uh, what's good, everybody? And Joy. Hello, this is Joy Chastain. How are you out there? <laughs> so tonight we're going to uh, have a general discussion about the upcoming elections, um, which is on Tuesday. So remember, vote, vote, vote. Um, tonight we're going to talk about Measure X, Measure W, talk a little bit about Prop 10, Prop 8, and Prop 6, as long as we have enough time. Um to get the conversation started, um, I wanted to throw a question out there. Why do you all think voting is so important? Um, I'll kind of start with that because I am a little probably non-traditional about my point of view with that. Um, I don't think voting is the solution to all of our problems. I want to be really upfront with that. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of valid points uh, made by folks who are very frustrated with a system where our vote doesn't count the way it should. And that's because of money and politics. That's because of power and corruption. That's a lot of reasons that certain systems have to be dismantled. So it's not like our vote, our vote it really has the weight of the value that it should. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do vote and I, and I, and I vote because uh I come from a community um, and I come from ancestry where my relatives were not allowed to vote, even though they were citizens. Uh, My grandparents uh, lived in Los Angeles and East Los Angeles and Compton. I grew up in Compton. My parents grew up in Compton um, and I grew up in uh, Compton, Lakewood and Long Beach. And I, uh, I, I saw, you know, uh, mostly my grandmother, um, you know, really struggle with, even though technically by law she had the right to vote, um, she didn't believe she had the power to vote for a long Mm -hmm. time. It wasn't until later in her life that she started voting. And, of course, um, you know, I really feel like the system, there's a lot of people who are left out of the system um, and believe that they don't have a say because of their citizenship status, because of their their uh, being in poverty, because of lots of different reasons. So a patriarchy is a big a big one. Like I know a lot of folks where you know the women are not allowed to vote because the men make the decisions in the household. You know, and so I vote to push back against that. I vote to push back against patriarchy. I vote for my grandmother and my great grandmother. I vote for the seven generations to come. And it, it's something I do very kind of like, I know it's ideal, it's mm-hmm. like idealism, and it's kind of like, you know, a hope that sometimes it makes a difference. And I think it has the biggest impact at the local level. Like, I made a difference in local campaigns. I know right. I have. And and so uh, that's why I vote. But I also think, like like anything else, we got to be critical of who's left out. And, right. and most of all, we have to listen about who's not voting. Right. And that's youth. Yes. You know, that's like specific populations are not are not participating. And instead of throwing salt at them, we need to listen and learn and pay attention as right. to why that is happening. And I hear a lot of these folks who are just like so God, like so disgustingly judgmental about folks that are not voting. Mm-hmm. And it really, really turns me off and pisses me off because they're really missing the boat on understanding why that's happening and looking at what we can do to change the system so those people want to vote, so their vote has some value. Because right now they feel like it has no value. Can I piggyback on that real quick? 
one of the things that I wanted to throw out there is, and I'll say that I'm going to attribute a part of this to you, is one of the things that I learned when I was in junior college was the importance of voting. Because, you know, um, as someone who was formerly in our student government, that was the first place where I really saw where our votes actually mattered, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is 20 years ago. But still, you know, it was it was an opportunity to see, you know, the work that we were doing as student government actually meant something. Going to actually lobby and talk to like the the, was it the Congress people and senators and all this stuff. And then seeing how we've had an actual impact on the campus. And this is, again, 20 years later, the work that we put in and the voting that we did, the lobbying that we did made an actual impact. Yeah, like re- real talk. Let's talk about, you know, real talk, like. In the time that we were students, you know, uh, we advocated and passed uh, a, a financial, uh, you know, proposition mm-hmm. that allowed us to have a campus center. On campus, yes. Right. So yes. that building and everything in that building would not even exist today had students not organized around that. Right. And got that, you know, the same thing with the Dreamer Center. We wouldn't right. have a Dreamer Center if students didn't advocate and organize around that. And so I, I do believe like your examples right on the money, right? At the local level, we have the most power to be able yes. to influence decision making. But a lot of that depends on, you know, uh, people playing a fair game. Right. People coming to the table in a fair way and not just, um, you know, coming to the table for their own self-interest. Mm. And I think that's a, the real thing because as we know, we've even seen student governments where, you know, they were there for their own self-interest yep. and things fell apart and and people have to be removed from office. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes the students don't recover for years when yes. that happens on a campus. And so we hope and wait for the new leadership to come to to make a difference. But, you know, sometimes it goes bad, too. So we have to we have to be really honest about what the system can do, what the what, what the voting system can do. That's good. And then, you know, what's very wrong with the system, you know, and then that's where the diversity of tactics comes in. Like we always talk about diversity of tactics. If you choose not to exercise your vote, I respect that. But what are you doing? Are you organizing? Are you protesting? Are you doing direct action? Are you what are you doing to change something if you're going to just not you can't just not vote and do nothing else. Right. That is not a solution. So, Jason or Joey, how about either of you? I think it's also important to say that if you don't exercise your rights, a lot of times you also lose them. And uh, we talk about things like Jim Crow as if they're things that are in the past. But Jim Crow is back. They're, the 1% is still trying to take people's rights away and still trying to take people's ability to exercise their voices away from people. Mm. And it's it ha- wasn't that long ago. When people of color were not allowed to vote, it wasn't that long ago that women were not allowed to vote. People actually died right. to give people the right to vote. And it is so easy to lose our democracy. It is so easy to lose our vote. It is so easy for that to happen. Just in the most recent election, we saw, if you excuse me for expressing my opinion here, we saw two candidates who both rigged presidential elections. We saw Hillary rig a presidential election, and we saw Trump rig a presidential election. And it is so easy for someone who could be a complete maniac to take over this democracy. It is so easy to get candidates that the people absolutely do not want in power. In power, and the and it is so important that we are that we fight back against people like this. And one of the major ways of doing this is by voting. I understand that a lot of people don't think their vote matters because of things like this happening, but trust me, your vote matters. Thank you. I think for me, um, especially ending on the piece about, like, does your vote matter or not, um, I have conversations with people all the time, and some people tell me straight up for that, like, I'm not going to vote. You know, I, and and when I listen to their reasons and they talk about how they've given up in the system or the accessibility of actually getting out to vote. I it's totally understandable. I'm not a harsh critic. I, I am I don't shame people for not voting. I completely understand them. Um, but I also challenge them at the end. I, I ask them, uh, you know, 
why are they not voting? And I give them my my reasonings why I vote. And, you know, I'll, and what I tell them is right off the bat, I'll be the first person to say, yeah, let's burn this motherfucker to the ground. Um, but like Mary had talked before, there is a diversity of tactics to the process. And understanding that, and I think back to my to my parents who who came to the U.S. from a uh, from war, from poverty, and Every every uh, election season, they always ask me, "Are you going to vote?" And as much as I may be like mad about it, I may be pissed about who's who who's up there or the props or whatever. In the end, I tell them yes because at, at the end, I I do also just like Mary recognize who who whose whose shoulders am I standing on, and if they cannot vote, then what can I do to allow them to have a voice? And I think at the end, we have to figure out is, at the end, yeah, part of, part of the problem is that part of the problem with people voting or not voting is that this institution was essentially created so that whether we vote or don't vote, um, you know, we're always going to be at the, the end, like, we're always going to get the bad end of the stick. But if we really, but if we really do think about it, too, it's also look at what's going on in the United States right now is that voter suppression is starting to become a big problem, whether it's in uh, the Dakotas right now where people can't, whether it's in the Dakotas right now where people are essentially saying you can't vote if you don't have a, I believe it's an actual address, so if you have a P.O. box, mm -hmm. you can't vote, or it's places specifically where the Republican Party or just other conservatives have a big uh, majority of the power where voter suppression is becoming a big thing and so to me it speaks volumes about the importance of, of voting so whether or not people disagree or don't like to for whatever reasons whether you're an anarchist who wants to you know who wants to take this system down or whether we're uh, somebody who works within the system you know I think for whatever reason we don't want to vote we still should vote regardless of how we feel and and Jason, I want to thank you for giving us that segue, because if we can, I do I do want to dig a little bit deeper about um, the challenges that we see and have seen in the media where folks are trying to prevent other folks from voting. Um, one of the big things that you're mentioning, I think that that was um, impacting the indigenous community, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, so if you all can, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, what are some things that you all have seen over, I'd say, maybe the last couple of weeks where people are being impacted um, in a way where they can't get to their polling places or they're not being allowed to vote because of certain... So certain I reasons. think, let's talk about our hood specifically, yes. right? And who's not voting. And I think there's two big factors there. Transportation yes. Yes. And, and access for people who work and go to school and have schedules where even by the time they get off of work and school and all that, you know, it's too late, the polls are closed. Yes. So... Um, one of the things I've talked about and proposed many, many times in many different forums is that why is not every college campus a polling location where people can turn in their mail ballot, where people can do a provisional ballot right. so they don't have to leave their local college campus um, and try to go to a polling place that might be far away or, uh, you know, have trouble with their mail ballot or any of the issues that we all know happen. And it's, it's a huge issue for students, especially students who live in another area than where mm -hmm. they vote, you know? And sometimes students will register with their dorm address mm -hmm. and uh, they won't take that registration because they, it looks like it's a business. Right. Or there's just like a lot of issues that disenfranchise young people right. and disenfranchise people that don't have reliable transportation, which is a huge portion of our community here in San Bernardino. And so how can we do a better job of making sure that the polling places are where the people are at and not making the people go to the polling places that are convenient for whoever is making those decisions? At Valley, we have 11 to 12,000 students. And, and those that's not even young people anymore. Like the right. average age of our student is like, I think, 24 years old. So uh, a lot of those folks are, are, are working class people, you know, but with with a concentration of 11 or 12,000 students, there is no reason why we shouldn't have a polling place on campus. And that would be taking the polling place to the voters. 
And Joy, I know you want to throw in something, but let me throw something out there real quick. The other thing that I'm, I'm thinking about when, when we talk about this is that's also another um, job opportunity. Yes. If, if we are looking at having polling places on campuses, you could hire students. Yeah. Why couldn't students be working those jobs? And that gets people more engaged because then they learn about these props and things that are happening. And the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the process. Yes, exactly. Um, Joe? Another major problem, Mary pointed out that they use the dorm addresses. Why do we even require addresses to vote? There are tons of homeless people mm. that can't register to vote what? because they don't have addresses. Mm. We disenfranchise. There are thousands of homeless people in this country mm -hmm. that cannot vote because they do not have physical addresses. And no one talks about this. I don't hear it talked about by anyone. Um, there's, also, there's also people that are kicked out of the voting rolls, and I personally have seen this because of various reasons. A lot of them people of color. There are also people who are um, kicked out, who are, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. There's also are people who have to have voter IDs mm -hmm. in, in, different, in different places and are not allowed to vote because they can't afford IDs. So and these are also major problems. And that again, that impacts with. the homeless. And this impacts the homeless, too, because a homeless person is not going to have an ID because they don't have an address to get the ID sent to. And Jason? Yeah, and I think on top of that, uh, I think I saw this recently uh, on the internet about uh, white supremacists and Nazis are, are, have already uh, announced that they are going to be at voting places to keep certain people from voting, in this case people of color. And then, we, and I saw that I think earlier in the week, and then literally like maybe an hour or two ago, I saw something about that the Black Panthers have to step in to help, uh, help take people, uh, you know, help protect people at the voting site. So the fact that this is becoming the issue that it is, is just like, you know, you really get to see the importance of why people, you know, the importance of voting. The fact that people are, have to single some people out and single some people in is just a, a continued example of it. And I think the other thing that was also coming to my mind is just the struggle, the hustle, you know, and capitalism as a whole. The fact that, you know, People can't vote because you gotta pay bills, you gotta survive, you gotta eat, you got a family to take care of. At the end of the day, you have other priorities. At voting is the last of those priorities, and the government isn't really making any rules about giving people days off on election day. No, nope, you know, and they do that in foreign countries. But isn't that the law? That um, employers are required to give at least two hours yes. off. Yes. Mm -hmm. But how many people actually take advantage of that? And do they know that they can? I, th I think it's not just an issue of is it a law? It's is it an enforceable law? Ooh, That's yes. the question, right? Because we have lots of labor laws. Right. And we all know those get violated all the time. Right. People don't get the pay they're supposed to get. People don't get the overtime. Right. That's why we have labor unions. Right. That's why we have a whole centered labor caucus is because we know people's labor rights get violated all the time, and it's not that easy to go through the system to be able to fight something like that as right. an individual and especially as a marginalized individual. So the question is not, is there a law? The question is, there is there an enforceable law? What recourse do employees have? If I work at Amazon and I don't have a union and I don't have a union rep and I tell Amazon I'm leaving – or two hours early so I can go vote, or I'm coming in two hours late so I can go vote, and, you know, I'm going to get fired and mm -hmm. lose my job because I'm likely there as a temp, right. you know, and it's super easy for them to fire me. They don't have to give any cause. Right. So that's the reality for mm -hmm. folks. Even though there is a law, not many people, very few have the privilege of being in a situation where their employer will actually follow the law. I just read today that the majority of countries in the Western world require that uh, employers shut down on Election Day. It is actually a national holiday in the majority of countries. Wow. Wow. That should happen here. <laughs> right? I Next was proposition. Say. We need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, um, one of the reasons that we see that not happening here is this thing that you were mentioning earlier, Joey, where folks are more concerned about trying to fix the elections to mm -hmm. benefit them as opposed to really trying to get everyone engaged Absolutely. and understanding what our process is, if that makes sense. Um, 
if we can, let's kind of segue over real quick. Let's actually talk about um, the, I, I'd say, do you want to do just measure X first or measure X and W? Let's do X and W together. All right, let's do that. So let's talk about measure X and W. Do y'all want to start? Or Mary, do you want to start it off? Uh, sure, I'll start it off. So I recently uh, sat in on a forum that was happening at San Bernardino Valley College uh, about Measure X and Measure W, and it was really interesting. I came to the, the table feeling very neutral about it, but after uh, hearing the presentation and, and doing some of my own research, I am like rock solidly on uh, that we need to approve Measure X and Measure W. Mm-hmm. Um, I really feel like Uh, The community is in a place where we need to educate folks about uh, cannabis. Like people have a real, real stigma and and, and it's being used by certain uh, entities like police to really scare the community that it's going to start the snowball of of drug use and all this kind of stuff. And I and it it reminds me uh, we were talking a little earlier about a poster from uh, Reaper Madness yes. and, and that that whole, you know, uh, film genre of like really demonizing and stigma stigmatizing marijuana as this gateway drug and this like equivalent to like, you know, all these other, you know, scandalous things that like crack. Yeah. Like or something. And, and just just really making it super extreme. And and I think we have to understand that the community has been subject to that propaganda for decades, yes. right? Like my parents and my my grandparents, you know, this was the the common thought process yes. behind behind cannabis. And so we have to understand that that, that change in that culture is not going to happen overnight. Yep. And I believe that uh, Measure X and Measure W is the stepping stone we need to get to more progressive uh, cannabis laws. It allows us to have some dispensaries but limits it. Right. Um, it also clears up some of the pro- problems from Measure O, which uh, some of you may have known that Measure O was passed before, but it went to court and was thrown out of court for violating the state law because it was poorly written. Um, so I think it's really important to understand that if we don't pass Measure X and Measure W, we're still going to have these issues around cannabis mm-hmm. that are going to leave leave us in this situation where it's highly uh problematic for communities Mm -hmm. and that the dispensaries are not having the the system and the regulations and the fees and all the stuff that would make it a little more controllable Mm -hmm. and and so i think from the community perspective Mm -hmm. we need to be really clear with community is like if you have a concern about cannabis running rampant in your community then measure X and measure W is a way to make sure that doesn't happen. Right. Not a, not a, a yes. measure to make it happen. It's right. a way to make sure it does not happen. Right. So uh, I think that that's an important part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. And then I also think that those of us who know about the benefits of cannabis, we need to do a way better job of educating the public about yes. it. And we got to start having conversations in the community about what are the, what are the benefits, not just from a medicinal standpoint, or a recreational standpoint, but from a standpoint of like, you know, using hemp for yes. building material, for Absolutely. clothing material, for for all for types, paper. for paper, for a lot of energy, our clean environmental energy. sustainability issues so that we can uh, take the conversation away from this propaganda around drugs stigma mm-hmm. and put it back into a more holistic kind of view where we can look at more issues than just the the, uh, the recreational use of cannabis. And I do want to throw out there that one of the things, and listeners, if you can, please start doing your research on cannabis because we are not saying that we are pro-drugs. I don't consider cannabis a drug. I do consider it a form of medicine, which that's something completely different. I think that what has happened is for, for those of us that are uh, from a different generation, we understand that some of the original problems with cannabis came from the issues of the paper industry, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So, folks, if you can, do your research, check your history. And instead of embracing it as something that is is natural and is a part of our environment, we have put it in a – we put it as a Schedule 1 drug again for this this scare that had started from that propaganda. And that was, what, like the 1930s and 40s? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, But that'll be my piece. 
Um, Jason, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I know. Um, I know some of the history is, um, to my understanding, is that like uh, some of the anti-marijuana drugs that like originally happened were around one uh, the creation of ethno fuel mm-hmm. with uh, cannabis mm. and how of an impact would be against oil companies, and that was when cars were starting to become a uh, major business. Um, and on top of that, and uh, well, and how to really demonize it was around de- uh, demonizing uh, brown folk in particular, specifically Mexicanos. So I, so I think it's good for us to understand that where the anti-marijuana drugs originally came from was to continue allowing oil businesses to grow as corporations by de- by criminalizing people of color. Um, and I think another piece I kind of, and I joke around about this, but I'm also serious about it, is I'm always like, man, support your local hustler. Um, but I think what a lot of people don't understand, uh, or like what I kind of look at it with the Measure X and Measure W, is that um, while some people are out in the streets trying to legitimately make a business because they're trying to survive, you're now giving uh, people an opportunity to be part of a legal business. Yes, to be exactly. able to uh, to put their skills to the test while uh, you know away from being in the streets, away from doing it underground, away from cops being on like uh, from people you know having cops being on them. Um, I think uh, the possibility for for certain people to become uh, botanists essentially. Mm-hmm. I think this is a piece that I, I don't think a lot of people really recognize. Well, and if I can piggyback on that a little bit, um, I think it was Mary and I were having this conversation a couple of weeks ago about some of the revolutionary stuff that's happening in Oakland, where they're basically preventing big business from coming in and basically taking up all of the dispensaries and other organizations that are out there. Because they're something about the, the Bay is recognizing that people that have been incarcerated for uh, marijuana related charges those people are going to be released at some point, right? Because, you know, charges are being overturned. But why are we going to penalize those folks who were already, like you said, Jason, trying to make a living, trying to support their families and let big business come in and make all the money and those folks not have any access. And so I know some of the work that they're doing is about those folks that are being released as part of reparations. Those folks are getting the first chance at opening businesses um, oh, Jason or Joe, did you want to add anything? I'm personally against prohibition of any substance, honestly. Um, Portugal decriminalized all chemicals, and use of drugs went down in Portugal because they used the money that was spent on the taxation of that mm-hmm. to put into drug rehabilitation and to research actual drug rehabilitation and not the type of drug rehabilitation we do in the West. What mm. we have discovered is that the majority of drug addiction does not come from physical addiction. It comes from emotional addiction. And this is something that they have researched over and over again. The reason why most people become addicted to substances is because of psychological problems that they have, not because of being exposed to the drugs, which is what they've been telling us for years. They took rats mm-hmm. and What they originally did is gave them heroin and cocaine, and they found out these rats became addicted to them. But what they found out later on is when they took the rats and they put them in environments that were friendlier to the rats and gave them cocaine and heroin, they did not become addicted. The thing about about marijuana specifically, marijuana solves more problems with the body than it creates. There are very few harmful side effects to marijuana. Alcohol is far more dangerous Mm -hmm. to the human body than marijuana is. No one has ever died from marijuana consumption. Tons of people have died from alcohol consumption. Mm -hmm. Yet alcohol is legal and marijuana is not. This makes no logical sense at all. The other thing is, is that... There is so much economic benefit to legalizing marijuana as well. I personally have never used any illegal drug, and I don't intend to. 
but I fight for the legalization of them because of the benefits that it has. I think Mary had something to say. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of rebuttal a little piece of that. Like, I I see your point in not legalizing any substances, but I think that that is really something that the community will strongly disagree with always. Oh, I, and, I'm sure. And that. that's because, like, us personally, I think, lately we've been seeing a huge insurge in uh, certain substances like LSD. Mm -hmm. And those have immediately harmful effects that can be permanent damage to folks. And so I think to say all chemicals like is a very slippery slope where, where I think we need to really differentiate is we, you know, this is something like as indigenous people, mm -hmm. like we had these sacred plants and medicines. We right. had, you know, uh, certain medicines and we knew they had to be used in a certain way. And if they were used in the wrong way, they would become poisonous to the body. Yes. And, and, and there's, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wisdom and an art and a practice that needs to be taught from generation to generation. And the problem is we've been disconnected from that knowledge. Mm -hmm. So because of colonization, we have been disconnected from those knowledges and we no longer know what plants are appropriate mm -hmm. and how to use them. Mm -hmm. And so we, we abuse them. And I think we have to get back to a point where we are go moving away from synthetic drugs and prescription drugs and pharmaceutical industry that we're moving away from that and going back to a state of looking for natural medicines mm -hmm. and natural substances and then have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's super important because as, as it relates to decolonizing, we have to like have respect for the plants that we work with, you know, it's just like we have to have respect for the food that we right. eat and, and the water we drink right. and the air that we breathe. But let's take the example of water, for example. Mm -hmm. I can poison my body with water. If I drink so much water, even though water is good for me, I can literally drown my cells in water and die. Right. So it's all about the usage of it, moderation, mm -hmm. and, and, and any substance can become toxic to your body. Any substance, even water. So you have to like know what is the intent of, of the substance. You have to treat it with respect. You have to honor it the same way we honor the earth, the same way we honor the sky, the stars, you know, uh, the fire, yes. all of it. And, and as soon as we're not in that process and that system of doing that, as soon as we think we are smarter than Mother Nature and we're going to figure it out better, we start messing around with chemicals and put, adding all these things and, you know, making these combinations like that's when we start seeing the outcome of that. And the outcome of that is like how many people are getting Alzheimer's? How many right. people are getting autism? How right. many people, like there's so many things happening because we keep fucking with mother nature thinking right. that we're smarter than, than, than nature. And we uh, get to a point where we end up hurting ourselves with all these chemicals and substances and, you know, all this stuff that's supposed to be better for us, you know, but in the long run, it, is it better? You know, is it better than what Mother Nature provides? Right. And my argument would be, no, it's not better. That we have to get more wise and reconnected to the way medicines used to be and, and, and really figure out. I totally agree with the emotional piece mm -hmm. of what you're saying for addiction. But I think that there are substances out there on the streets right now that I will never, ever, ever endorse as being okay for someone to take. And that's because the harm outweighs the benefit, mm -hmm. and they're not natural medicines. Um, I was also going, I mean, um, I guess the way I'm thinking about Mary uh, with her statement specifically, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the CIA bringing in cocaine from South America into uh, the U.S., uh, specifically to create crack cocaine in the 90s, I mean, in the 80s and the 90s. Now, Jason, before you go too hard, please don't get us banned. <laughs> <laughs> my bad, I know it's my first time. <coughs> but, um, but even more so than that, um, I think I will always, uh, I will always go back to the answer of like, yes, we need to decolonize. Whether right. it's decolonizing our view on uh, sacred ceremonial medicines, or even how do we decolonize voting in itself? Right. Um, you know, I'm a big, strong believer in collective decision making and the consensus process. Mm -hmm. 
And I know maybe that's harder to implement at a state or federal level, but, you know, how do we start, look, you know, what do we do at a local level? Um, but the piece I wanted to add specifically to what Matt was saying earlier, especially about what Oakland and uh, what other groups are doing specifically about marijuana is that um, I think at the end of the day, like, we, let's look at Colorado right now. It's a population with majority uh majority white folk um, mm -hmm. and right now a, although marijuana is uh, legalized out there uh, specifically POC mm -hmm. POC youth are getting stopped more at a higher rate because mm -hmm. of it and so so there is still an element of racism uh, racism behind some of these laws mm -hmm. and I think at the end of the day the fact and like going back to what you said about big businesses coming mm -hmm. in is that the fact that in this case white man or rich white folk can come into a community uh, and make a profit off the very same thing gentrification that, yeah, the very same <laughs> thing that POC have been doing and being criminalized for and being jailed in, not just for a year, not mm -hmm. just for a couple months or a couple years, but for decades of their life, yes. is part of the problem. And that is part of the re uh, reparations. I think us as a community need to call, uh, need to demand. And although Measure X and W is not that itself, it is a step towards that progress. Right, right. Um, now, before we move forward, I did want to just throw a quick comment out there just to talk about, you know, things that can be poisonous for our body. Um, you know, we focus on marijuana or we, we're focused on the idea of cannabis just in general, and people still think that it's, it's a, a toxic plant, whatever, whatever people's misconceptions are. But the one thing that we don't talk a lot about is the things that we use on our bodies like deodorant. Mm. The amount of deodorants that have aluminum in it as a part of the antiperspirant. So, you know, we How about always, the fluoride in the water. Oh, don't even get started on that. <laughs> cool. Chlorine future, in the water. Future podcast, future podcast warning now, <laughs> future podcast, those things that kill us. Um, but I think I was listening to the read recently and they were talking about it because of course they were doing an advertisement uh, for, I think it's a, a new like coconut deodorant or whatever, but they were talking about the fact that, we get so many aluminum deposits in our body that they think that that's what leads to Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And I know personally, I've had some experiences where I end up breaking out from that aluminum. And it's like, okay, this is something that is supposedly healthy and it's poisoning my body. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so I just want to make sure that we can kind of move on a little bit. Um, let's talk about Prop 10. Um, who you wants you to, want to start with that? Well, um, Prop 10 is um, a measure that allows um, local communities to be able to set their own laws in regards to rent control. Mm. Um, a few years ago, several communities started to do, use rent control, and there was a um, there were some lawyers that challenged this in court, and it was thrown out by the state of California. Um, I can't remember what were the names of the lawyers. Uh, either do you remember? Um, anyway, the there was a, um, a big hoo-ha about this, and um, this was challenged and defeated, and now um, the state of California controls every law when it comes to rent control, and um, what we want to do with Prop 10, which I think um, we're all pretty much in agreement here about this, is to allow communities to set their own laws about this mm -hmm. and stop poor people, people of color, older elderly people, veterans, from being kicked out of their houses because rent is too high. Mm. So I guess kind of my question is, and I'll throw this out to you all. Um, so I've been getting a lot of mailers and things. <laughs> and I want to throw this out there because I can tell that it's been targeted, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that I wonder is, I remember, oh, this has had to be at least 10 years ago. Um, my sister was living by Cal State San Bernardino, and at that time, her rent was already almost $1,000, and it was for, like, a one-bedroom apartment. Um, it was upstairs. It was a decent neighborhood, and I, don't, I haven't even checked what the rent is in that area now, but I'm assuming it's probably at least two grand, mm -hmm. you know? So, 
for those folks that are out there, what could this prop proposition do to to kind of stop that or or to to I guess help it if I can, if I can say that. I think I think what the problem is 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 people the opposition is painting this as uh, that it's going to make rents go up more mm-hmm. because it allows an incremental uh, percentage of the rent increase every year. And that they're saying that the landlords will automatically do the increment every year. Mm -hmm. But what happens now is, and and this is something we see all over San Bernardino, right, Mm -hmm. is is that we have people, outsiders, who come in and buy up property in the Inland Empire because it's cheap. And they can no longer buy property in L.A. or Orange County or any of the surrounding counties. So they come to the IE and they buy up property cheap. And then they put low income housing mm-hmm. or or um or huge uh you know apartment complexes that are intended for folks who make low income mm-hmm. and and they they build these huge properties and it's about quantity over quality so mm-hmm. they literally try to create housing that has the most amount of of tenants that they can squeeze into a building uh, with no regard to quality of life or mm. anything else, right? So they they do build these complexes and they and they charge a certain rate. And then what happens is someone might live there for a number of years, and 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 the and then all of a sudden, you know, the company sells the building and a new company buys the building, mm-hmm. and this happens quite frequently. The turnaround mm-hmm. of companies buying and selling buildings. And the new company buys the building and they want to recover the money that they just paid because of the increase in the property value. Right. And so they they turn around right away and raise the rent like in an affordable manner mm-hmm. so that the people living in the house have to living in the apartment have to move out. Right. And then those people are forced to move out and then they raise the rent a huge amount to try to to get other people in there, mm-hmm. you know, to make more money. So it becomes just this snowball of profiteering and profit making, mm-hmm. and it really invites slumlords to our community. Mm-hmm. It, put, it lays a red carpet for them, saying, "Come to our community and buy up these vacant lots and build a giant complex on here, and and this is how you're going to get your cash cow. And you don't even have to take care of the properties because the people who enforce that, like code enforcement, they don't enforce corporations the same way they enforce people." Right. Like if my grass grows over three inches, I get a court enforcement thing like lickety splat. Right. Like just so quick. And but a corporation, especially uh, slumlords, can have violation after violation Mm -hmm. after violation after violation. And there's no consequences. They don't have to fix those things. They, you know, they never get fined. Like it's just like there's very little consequences for that and very little recourse for the Mm -hmm. tenants. So it creates this cycle where folks are at huge high risk of homelessness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the whole point of Proposition 10 is to try to allow landlords to increase the rent, but at a moderate rate each year, mm. like a certain percentage, like 2%, 3%, you know, okay. something that's more accessible than 50% or right. 60% and then just forcing families out. Right. And so I think that it's the intent is that hashtag we use over and over again same villains, right? right. These are right. these really t- real, not realtors like individual realtors, but these uh, realty packs, mm. which are mm. these slum lords that put all their money together. And it's my understanding these packs have put in over seventy million dollars. That's seven zero million dollars to fight Prop Ten. So the, wow. sometimes you can make all the arguments in the world, but the thing that's most compelling to me mm-hmm. is which villains are fighting this issue. Right. And when I see a $70 million price tag against slumlords trying to fight this issue, and I see the mailers in my box every friggin' day, I'm like, oh, they really don't want this. Mm-hmm. They really don't want this so bad that it must be good for the community. Because right. you know, like the only time they put that much money in anything because they're all about profits. So why would they spend $70 million? Think about it. Why would they spend $70 million of their profits to stop something unless they knew that that was going to be a fraction of what they actually make off profits by having the law right. the way it is, right? That means that that's got to be like, you got to multiply that $70 million times 100 right. because that's the real profit they're making. Right. And that's the problem. 
because those people who are making those profits off the backs of our community don't live in our community. They live somewhere else. Yep. And so we have to take control again of our community and we have to say it's up to our residents and our community and our leaders, our local leaders to decide what is fair for, for rent increase in our neighborhoods and that that should not be decided, uh, you know, by some slumlord or corporation that doesn't really care about this community because they're not vested in it in the same way we are as people who live here. Right. Um, I think it was Jason, Jason. Person and Joe. Yeah, I think, um, and this doesn't just go for Prop 10. I think this goes for any proposition ever. Mm-hmm. And it's the fact that um, at the end, if you really like look at who is endorsing, who is funding what, and you follow the money trail, you follow any trail, you start to really see who wants what to pass and who doesn't want to pass. And I mean, quite frankly, I doubt it. Most of any of us here have about seven million dollars collectively. Seventy million. Seventy million. Yes, yeah, seventy million. I mean, I'm trying not to cause, but shit. Like, even I, I bet if a lot of us, like if half of the community out here try to put seven million dollars together, we'd still come out short. Mm-hmm. And I think that speaks to me. That speaks volumes. So I say to folks who are getting all these mailers, prop, no on Prop 10, uh, I want folks to really think about it. Who has enough money to send all those mailers out? Because obviously we don't. And that goes by for, for, mo- for any proposition. And, you know, luckily, you know, I think it's by law or something that we're supposed to, any mailer that comes uh, to somebody's door has to say where it's coming from. The Guns Correct Labor Federation, the the realtors, the whatever. Yeah, but they get real tricky about that. They'll create a pack that says, you know, for the good housing for the community pack. And it'll be actually, you know, the 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 same villains who mm-hmm. are the slum lords and the ones, you know, like who are making a profit. And so you have to be careful about the pack names because they are deceiving on purpose. But the yeah. pack names give out one clue though. And if you and that's a and the clue itself is the title of the pack. Once you really start digging your research mm-hmm. on what the pack is, then you start to realize, like Mary said, same villains. And I think Joe, Joe, you had something you wanted to add? Well uh Mary mentioned that the the slum lords don't have to pay fines. Um Really, even if they did have to pay fines, that's not a big deal to them because these people are spending seventy million dollars to exactly. defeat this proposition. If they pay a two hundred or a three hundred or one thousand dollar fine, that's nothing to them. Mm-hmm. Right. Also, when we talk about when we talk about the the packs and researching where the packs come from, mm-hmm. who has the time in our local community when some of these people have to work two or three jobs mm-hmm. to keep their head above water to pay for their kids? welfare, I mean, to, to buy their kids breakfast and milk and all this stuff. Who has the time to research these packs? And they're counting on that. They're counting on you not knowing where the money is coming from. And keep that in mind. They want to keep you ignorant. They want you not to know where the money is coming from. Always keep that in mind. These people want you to be dumb. Well, one thing I want to throw out there, and I, I'm, Mary, I'm glad that you threw this out there about how it's a, an incremental increase that could be maybe like 2%. So I just did some quick math. Um, one thing that I've seen, um, I'd say over the years, is most people's rent, they increase by like $25 or maybe $50 or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. If you're doing it by percentage, if someone had like rent that was six twenty five dollars and it's only 2%, that's only $18. Mm. So they end up saving quite a bit from that because over that course of that year, that $25 increase or whatever, that's what a couple, I think it's a couple thousand. Yeah, it builds up, it builds up pretty quickly. And I think it's also important for us to push the narrative about this also guarantees landlords their rights. Like this isn't just about tenants. Oh, true. This is about responsible landlords that actually own property and probably live in this community. 
because right. we don't want to hurt them. We want people to buy properties. We yes. want people to buy properties and have affordable rentals for our community because not everybody can buy property. So we need rentals, but we need them from local people who care about this community, who understand the struggle that our community members are in and that are also guaranteed uh, you know, a fair return on their property mm-hmm. and that the, they'll be able to raise the rent every year in a reasonable way. You know, I think that's fair. And I think that's also like, you know, a good incentive and reward mm-hmm. system for landlords that really love this community. And that's what ultimately what we want. We want people who want to be here and invest in our communities. And that means we don't want gentrification. We don't want corporate greed that's going to come from Wall Street to buy up yep. all the property. We know those those are not the solutions, and that's why San Bernardino is in the mess it's in right now. And and so it's like, how do we turn the tide? How do we get what we want, which is people who love this community, mm-hmm. investing in this community mm-hmm. at the local level, and keep those dollars here in our neighborhoods? Well, and the thing that that makes me think about is that realistically, folks don't want local folks to build wealth. Because Mm -hmm. if we build wealth, what are we going to do? I think that more people that actually live in this community would decide to stay in this community. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. yes. Like for most of us, you know, we're we're all we all still live here. Right. Mm Right. But how many of us that went to high schools in this area had that dream that once I graduate, I'm going to move away? I'm going to leave this place. And we have chosen to stay here because we believe in this community that we live in. And we see the value of being here and being present and showing future generations. This ain't a bad place to live. Um, I, have, I have lots of love for, for the IE. This is my home. This is where I tell people, like, this is where my fight's at. You know, I can travel right. and go all over the world here and there. You know, in solidarity with people's struggles, but at the end, this is where my community is at. This is where my struggles is at. I will live here, and I will probably die here. And, um, and I love that idea, and I'm okay with that. And I think uh, just recognizing that these landlords, like Mary said, most of them don't live here, but to what extent it is, mm-hmm. some of them, they don't live in this city. Many of them don't live in the county, mm-hmm. not, and sometimes they don't even live in this state. So the fact that many of these mass apartment complex got roaches in the kitchens and rats between the walls in a community where brown and black folks are constantly struggling to survive, whether it's against cops, whether it's to hustle to survive, whatever, you know, somebody gets shot up out here, and it happens way too often. You know, and it happens with these very same apartment complex, and I'm thinking specifically of uh, my my friend and homegirl uh, Ashley, who who lived in one of these apartment complexes recently, where ten people were shot um, uh, in San Bernardino, I, I believe last month. And these are the conditions, and at the end, these apartment co- uh, like these slum lords. They don't affect them. They don't got to deal with it. They don't got to see it. So who gives a fuck? And that's literally their mentality about us. Right. I want to add one more thing, too. Like, I think a really big part of this conversation on Prop 10, like, nobody wants their rent to go up. You know what I mean? Like, nobody wants to stop legit uh, landlords from making a profit off their investment. You know, but what is the real problem that we are facing in this Mm. community? Like, and it really all communities across the state that I have been seeing lately, mm-hmm. and and that's homelessness. Right? Yes, exactly. Homelessness, and and I think that like let's really get to the root of that, and 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 how do we get people off the streets? And I know there's always going to be some level of homelessness, but lately, as I've been traveling in different communities, mm-hmm. I have seen astounding mm-hmm. amounts of homeless camp encampments. I have seen people with young children homeless. As I talk to people who are teachers, they're, you know, social workers, the students, uh, college students at our community colleges, Mm -hmm. there are huge rates of homelessness and it is rising and it is rising at a scary pace. And if we do not do something, 
If we do not do something, we are literally going to be in a place where the homeless folks are going to outnumber the folks who are, you know, hopeful. And, and I think that that's really important. There's a great organization uh, up north in the Bay uh, called Poverty Scholars. Mm, and they do mm-hmm. an amazing job working with homelessness community. And they, call it, they don't call it homelessness. They call it homefulness. Mm. And they do a lot of work around, like, you can't sweep us away. We're not trash or debris. You can't, you can't just ignore us and sweep us under the rug. Hide us when there's a big football game at the Coliseum. Right. You know, like, you, you, can't, you hear these stories about how there'll be a big event and, and whole cities will try to hide their homeless yep. people, you know, like yep. their homeless situation. Do you hear and, that here? Yeah, they do it all over the world, you know. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I really love the work that some folks are doing to uh, to really change the narrative about that and to understand that anybody could become homeless. Like we're all just one paycheck away from that. Mm-hmm. And if we don't do something about rent control, if we don't do something to ensure that our community has affordable housing, then the the consequences of that are going to affect all of us, yes. not just the homeless folks. It's going to affect all of us. And we have to understand how that directly relates to us. And we have to do something to make sure that we're addressing uh, homelessness for our community and looking at solutions. And this is one of those solutions. Um, before we go to Joey, I just want to throw out there, there was a movie, I do not remember the name, but it's um, directly connected to the Poor People's Campaign mm. that talks a lot yeah. about this. Yeah. And so for folks that are out there listening, if you can, please look up the Poor People's Campaign so that you can understand what we're talking about and some of the actions that people have done to make sure that they're not housing insecure. That's mm-hmm. another one that I've heard. Mm-hmm. Um, Joy, what do you want to add to it? I just want to say real fast, my last point in this subject, is we talk about how young people do not own homes anymore and how less and less people are owning homes. How can you own a home when these slumlords are buying up all these homes and making huge amounts of profit on charging people thousands and thousands of dollars on rent every year? How can you do it when they are buying up all the property and making a fuckload of money on poor people? Right. So um, I want to change gears a little bit and um, in, in lieu of time, um, I know we do want to talk about Prop 8 and Prop 6. Um, who wants to start with Prop 8? Joe, do you know a little bit more about Prop 8? Uh, that Prop 8 I'm not that familiar with. I'm not as familiar with. I know a little bit about it, but uh, somebody else might want to take that. Mary, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I think Prop Eight is the the proposition that's dealing with uh, the dialysis yes. issue, and so um, you know, I I don't know a lot about it, but I I do know a little bit, um, and I think most uh, folks are are that I'm working with, which is like the California Labor Federation, mm-hmm. uh, the IE United. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the uh, more progressive organizations are asking for folks to vote yes on Prop 8. Um, And I think I've heard that there is a lot of opposition coming from folks that there's a lot of scare tactics being used Mm -hmm. with with Proposition 8, which is very similar to Prop 10, right? Mm -hmm. You see a lot of ads where it's like, you know, this is going to affect senior citizens or this is going to affect people of color. And so I've seen the same type of ads coming around Prop 8 where Mm -hmm. it's really targeting people who are, you know, in vulnerable positions, Mm -hmm. right? They're vulnerable states. They're, they have a health issue. They're going through dialysis. It's already very scary. Mm -hmm. And so it's easy to kind of say like, you know, this is going to cause your, your, your dialysis to be unaffordable Mm -hmm. and you're not going to have access to it. And it's going to cause people to die. And it's very like it's it's being framed in such a way that is very like the opposition is using fear yes. and, and using uh, patient fear to 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 oppose this measure. But I think it's really important that we understand that same tactic has been used against other labor issues for many, many years. Let's take like United Farm Workers, right? Mm-hmm. The, the the boycott of our farm workers and, and the and the and the the move by big agriculture was mm-hmm. like, no, if we allow the farm workers to unionize, 
then grapes will be $10 a bundle and your food price is going to go up and it's going to become unaffordable. And that's why we can't pay them. Are still a dollar yeah, ninety nine. Uh, we can't pay Isn't them a living. Their argument? We we can't pay them a living wage, and we can't have bathrooms in the fields, and we can't do all these things because oh my god, it would it would it would it would the price would end up becoming transferred to the customer, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's a scare tactic, right? It's it a is. scare tactic to keep them from organizing. We see the same thing happening with Walmart. You know, people are like, no, we can't pay Walmart a living wage because. You know, that half their employees are, are eligible for food stamps because mm-hmm. their wages are so low. Amazon, yep. same thing. You know, they say, oh, we can't allow our folks to organize uh, Amazon because then uh, all the things you're ordering on Amazon will become unaffordable. Mm-hmm. You know, like, and these are arguments, they're tactics to union bust. That's right. what they're doing. And so the reality of this situation is that, yes, on Prop 8 helps protect the workers who are caring for these patients who are vulnerable. Mm. And just like any other, you know, uh, field, you know, the medical field is a place where I want the doctors taken care of. Mm -hmm. I want the nurses taken care of. I want the medical staff taken care of. I want them to have the resources they need to do their job. And if they're not allowed to have breaks, if they're not allowed to have like a livable wage, if they're not allowed to, to, to work in an environment that's a good, healthy environment for them, they're not going to go to do a good job taking care of patients. Mm-hmm. You know, the end of the the end result of that is more people dying because the staff cannot work. Yeah, they're, they're, they cannot physically do the job the way it needs to be done. And so these are what this is one of the fields where I feel like yes, on Prop Eight is a necessity. Like mm-hmm. we need to make sure that these employees are allowed to organize, that they are supported in in the way that allows them to have a living wage, allows them to have breaks, allows them to do all the things they need to do. And I'm going to support people who who work in this field Mm. by voting yes on Prop 8. And I hope other people will too, because at the end of the day, it goes back to that saying of if you let this happen here, then you're gonna let you're gonna let it happen somewhere else. And I'm mm. blessed to have a job where I have a union that protects me and I have certain rights that protect me and I know that I'm very privileged to have that. And I think mm. all employees should have that. No matter where they work, they should have that right. And until we get to a part where we understand that and we see that and we support that as a community, then we're gonna keep having these problems where, again, same villains, mm-hmm. who doesn't want that to happen? The people who are making the largest amount of profit, the people that are making millions of dollars of profit, those are the people that don't want this bill. And if you look at the who's opposing it, it's those same funders mm. that are, are, are opposing Prop 10. It's the same people that they, they don't want uh, their profits to be impacted. Right. And it has nothing to do with the quality of care for uh, medically needy folks. Wow. Any comments or rebuttals from you guys? Cool. I mean, uh, wow. I'm Mary, you blowing minds. <laughs> um, if we can, um, let's talk about Prop 6 a little bit. Now, are either of y'all comfortable? I can, I can talk about uh, Prop 6 a little bit. Basically, um, it's... This is a more controversial one for most people because it's about the gas tax mm. um, and it's about infrastructure. Uh, California passed by voters a tax on gasoline that would be used to repair our roads, our bridges, our freeways, our um, infrastructure, which is in dire need of repair. People do not like this because of the fact that it raised our gasoline prices. Mm -hmm. And our gasoline prices are higher than most of the rest of the country. Now, one of the things that I ask about this is, why are we even still using gasoline? Mm -hmm. At this point, we should have an alternative fuel source. Hydrogen cars could be very cost efficient. I don't understand why gasoline cars are even still even a thing, to be honest with you. But anyway, our um, infrastructure is in dire need of repairs, and I I personally am uh, supporting keeping the gasoline tax 
in order to keep our infrastructure in place and being repaired. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think, um, again, this is another, you know, the voters spoke. It was a very mm -hmm. controversial uh, issue. I was involved in several conversations at the local level where folks were divided. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was very close. Uh, on one hand, I, I felt I feel like the taxation of gasoline is the only thing that's going to get us to move away from fossil fuels, because the only thing that will stop the companies who are who want to make sure that we are dependent on fossil fuel mm -hmm. is money. That's the only thing that will stop them. So when we tax gasoline, it is a direct, it is a direct, uh, you know, fight against big oil. Mm. And it's saying to big oil, if you continue to use your political power. And buy off politicians, which is what they do, hashtag Chevron Cheryl, <laughs> then you are going to continue to see like nobody wanting to invest in absolutely green technology, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely uh, zero emission technology. Mm. And so we have to see through that charade and we have to understand that. When they come back and they try to stop that, it's because they have no intent of getting to zero mm. emission technology. There are too many people making money off of the oil industry, and yes. they're not willing to let it go no matter how bad it fucks up the environment, no matter how bad it is for communities, no matter how bad. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand that it's up to us, that we have to make it literally unaffordable for them to continue that path mm. and we have to make it to where they are forced to start looking at zero emission technology as a viable option and this is for not just the car industry this is for the transportation and logistics mm -hmm. industry this is for you know the train industry nope. this is for the equipment industry this is for all the industries from the gas blower to the the, the big industries that mm -hmm. are reliant on fossil fuels. And until Factories. we until we overtax them, they're not going to do it voluntarily. They're never going to do it voluntarily. We have to make it so painful for them to continue in the status quo mode that they've been continuing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and really, you know, we need this money. We need this infrastructure. I don't know if y'all know about the potholes happening in San Bernardino, but oh. it is like right now we're on 8th and E in San Bernardino. And then when you drive down 8th Street, it's like literally, I feel like I'm in the Indiana Jones ride at yes. Disneyland. Like it's like, you know, pothole after pothole after pothole. And these are the communities where those infrastructure issues yes. are, are the most, you know, damaging and we get the least attention. And keep yeah. in mind, I just want to throw in, and then uh, Jason, you're up next. Um, one of the things that we haven't really touched on, but having messed up streets like that, mess up people's cars, mm -hmm. which prevents them from getting to work, mm -hmm. which does what? Impacts their source of income, which impacts their living, which impacts their food. I mean, there's so many things that that impacts, and we're barely scratching this. It also makes them less fuel efficient. Oh, oh yes, of it's course. It's a cycle. And then Jason? I know... Um, just the other day, a couple weeks ago, I got a brand new used tire, <laughs> and because um, <laughs> there's no way I can buy, buy really buy brand new, brand new, brand new tires, and because you know my the, my tire went went out because you know you you drive a lot that's what happens, and like maybe like what was it two three days later pop hit a pothole boom now I gotta go uh, like put money to go get another tire. Wow. And where was that at? That was like in um Colton. So it's not that was in Colton and then and and I'm usually super cautious about it since I'm always driving around San Bernardino right. for potholes and that's the thing and you know for one second you, you may stop paying a second paying attention for one second and boom, right there. Pop tire, you know? And I think that's the conversation I'm having with people about the no on pop sticks is just like think about the money you are saving in 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 tires really if uh with these roads really being taken care of because if they're not being taken care of 
you can easily have a pop, uh, uh, um, a tire pop, and you can eat or wait or at a faster rate, you'll lose your tires. But I'm also, um, you know, at the end, I am voting no on pop sticks, but mm. I also want to add in, uh, be a bit of a devil's advocate on this one. Oh. Not specifically because my dad's a trucker. Mm. So I, you know, I hear his struggles and I know he comes from about like, especially, um, especially when years ago we had to, uh, my dad had to, you know, and this is my dad as a, as somebody who's not part of a corp, who does, he was a trucker, but isn't all, you know, he owns his own truck. He's own, he owns his own trailer. Uh, he can't really afford to make big drastic changes since it's just him and what he hustled to get. You know, he does, he's, you know, it's not like he's working for Swift or some other trucking company where, oh yeah, we got to change. Uh, we, there's a new law in California where we have to have more uh, sustainable um, trucks that are more environmentally friendly. Mm-hmm. No, that, that means that's, that means you're messing with individual people's livelihood. And mm-hmm. so I haven't had the conversation about Prop 6 with my dad yet. So hopefully that, that'll that be a, a funny and interesting conversation when I have it with him in the next couple of days. I'm saying have him listen to the podcast after. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, after. you know, I, I put that way, you know, I say that with the understanding, you know, and I put that out there because I, I do understand, you know, you know, seeing how my dad works about why people are very yes in pop six, right? Because uh, especially for individual uh, people, but I think that also goes back to who does the system really support? The right. system does not care about local small businesses who are legitimately just trying to make a living. They're there to for for the inter, you know, to help the in, the oil industries, the enterprises, and I think. We as a, as a state and as a community have to find a way to one regulate oil like these big businesses without harming local people and then uh, local small business owners. Mm-hmm. And um, at the end, I think regardless of the con- well, regardless of the conversation I have with my dad, we still we do need to become more environmentally friendly. We are slowly and surely destroying our planet and even faster rate right now. And at the end, the best solution is have no oil. Period. Let's not keep destroying our planet. We are in. We have inherited. We do not own this planet. We are borrowing this planet from our children and our grandchildren. And at the end of the day, I rather if when if and when I have kids, I rather make sure that we do everything. We, we did everything we can to protect it and to leave our planet in a better place. Um, and you know, and I think it's good for us. And just you know, we we got to do what we got to do to support one another mm-hmm. and to make things easier, uh, especially as working class and low income people. Mm-hmm. Pero también, you know, like we also have to like we have to hustle to do better. Mm-hmm. And if that means like taking a step back from from using oil, then that's what it that's what it means. So in the last 10 minutes of our conversation, I have a two-part question for you all. Wait, before we move on, can uh-huh. I add one more thing on oh, Prop yeah. 6? Yeah, so I, I want to be really clear about people understanding what, what the deal is with Prop 6 and the motivation behind the people who are trying to pass this proposition. The current system requires a two-thirds vote of each state legislature, legislature chamber. And the governor's signature. So imagine the assembly and the Senate have to have two thirds approval of those bodies to get a a tax increase through. So this tax increase on gas went through that process and we got both the assembly and the Senate, you know, to be on board with that. Mm -hmm. And so that is very difficult, especially if you know about how much oil money is influencing local legislators. But, but, Legislators still saw through that and understood that our infrastructure, the state of our infrastructure is embarrassing. It's embarrassing to them because it's so bad that we need our roads and and, and things fixed because it's impacting truck drivers as well. It's Mm -hmm. impacting everybody who drives on the road. And so it's like people complain about it, but it's like we have 
we know what the solution is. We have to put money there, you know, right. to fix the roads. Right. And the more if, if people are not stopping driving, if we have more trucks on the roads, it, then we just have to. It's going to be an ever increasing problem. It's right. always going to be a problem. So this proposition would say, in addition to the two thirds, it also has to go to a vote of the people. Mm. And it's adding another layer of bureaucracy to make it harder. And I think that that's really the point that we have to pay attention to is that it, we have this system of the assembly and the Senate and the state legislature. And if we have no confidence in that system, then why don't we just dismantle the dismantle it for everything? Why only for gas do we say uh, only for this tax increase do we say we're going to ignore this system? But it's good for everything else. It's good for environment. It's good for education money. It's good for all the other decisions we have to make, but not for gas tax. Mm. That makes no sense. So, you know, I think like it's really important to look at the bigger picture here and why certain people are supporting uh, a, a yes vote on Proposition 6 and that those are folks who are basically saying, you know, that they want an exception, a special a special treatment for this, you know, mm-hmm. and I think it's 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 a special interest. It's clearly a special interest. And it's one of those things that we have to pay attention. It's going to have a bigger impact than just this one issue. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's once we start saying that, you know, even with two thirds of the assembly and two thirds of the Senate, mm-hmm. uh, it still has to go to the voters and, then, governor approval. And, and, and governor approval. Why do we even have an assembly and a Senate then? Let's let's just take them out and make everything go to voter approval. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, like it doesn't make any sense. And so I just want to be really clear about that. Maybe maybe because people only care about voting every couple of years when it's a thing. But um, I think there's a saying, um, and I could say it wrong, but I know it's on top of my head. So whoever knows what I'm trying to say, correct me if I'm going to say it wrong. Um, You can't have your cake. And eat it too. Eat it too. Yes. And the and the thing is That's exactly is that, what they're doing. Yes. And and the thing is is that people will people complain. People complain about the roads. You know these roads are dirt. When is the government gonna do something about it? When when is the politicians gonna do something about it? And then we're like, well, if we increase the tax, since there's no money, well, supposedly, but um, if we increase the tax, since there's no money, then we can fix it. Well, but then that's my money. Well, then why are you complaining? There is a solution to everything. And sa- and part of it is we have to put some of our time, effort in it. Sometimes we can't put our money, and I understand it. Then what are you personally doing to advocate or to fight for some of these I- issues? There is money out there. And some and, and, and are folks putting their time and effort to get involved in some of these issues? No, they really don't. They, but but as soon as it's voting times, rah rah rah! Everybody ready to make some noise about what the issues are about and what do they care about? But every other every other day, every other month, nobody really gives a damn about the issue, and and that goes for a lot of things. I know for conservatives, they they talk about no, we don't want the government involved in our stuff. Yes, I agree. I I hate the government getting involved. But then let's look at one of the propositions, and I'm just going to throw this out there without us discussing <laughs> wait, wait, it. Wait, wait, just pull it back just a little bit, just a little My bit. Bad. Pull it back just a little bit, um, because I also don't want us to 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 get sidetracked. Um, the other thing, and and mm-hmm. you were kind of going there with it. Um, so the last two questions I have, because it's it's really where you're going. Um, what are some things you all are doing to make sure your voice, your vote, and your voice counts? And the other thing is. What does organizing look like during an election year? You know, and maybe you can start that off, Jay. Um, I think, um, I mean, organizing for elections is, um, or campaign is essentially campaigning. Um, it looks different from grassroots organizing. Mm-hmm. This form of organizing is not about. Uh, it is about a form of community involvement, mm-hmm. but getting them involved in in, in an election, uh, mm-hmm. getting them to vote. So at this point, you know, it's all about the numbers. Uh, if you're 
pushing people to vote for a camp for a proposition or a politician, then it's all about who can bring the biggest numbers mm -hmm. so that you know you can win. Um, if it's about who just bringing out people to vote, it is still a numbers game. Mm -hmm. um, for for community organizing as a whole, mm -hmm. although numbers is important, community organizing is about creating community. It's but, about relationships. But the thing that I wanted you to kind of go back to, because this is where I think where you were going when you were in your very passionate response, <laughs> is that you know the big thing is people need to be able to express their voice. They need to be able to say something. And if they decide not to say something, what else are they doing? And I think that that's a part of what being a, an organizer is, is you're showing folks what the other options are, if that makes sense. Um, the other day, uh, somebody posted this about um, a lot of people that say F the system mm -hmm. um, are also the ones that are genuinely voting. Uh, not always the case, and and are also actively organizing. Mm -hmm. um, for for myself and for some of us here, uh, it organize community organizing isn't. Yay! We went to the march. You know, hoorah! You know, uh, power to the people. Fist up, and then go home and go do your thing. It is a a on the duty call twenty four seven three hundred and fifty six uh sixty five sixty five now I'm out of it right now it's nine days you don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> three hundred and sixty five days of the year job, you know. There really isn't no breaks. So Something yeah. goes down, it's two AM in the morning and it's an emergency, it's an emergency. Get up, you know. Right. And um and it's exhausting. You really get to see uh, uh how much, you know, we're you know, our people are really dealing with the struggle and, you know, and what we have to do to fight, and it, it takes a lot of energy. Um, and I think um, sometimes when it comes to the elections, then it feels like then all of a sudden the people that never really do anything, um, do anything during the other days of the year, over, over sometimes overshadow and overpower the people that are generally putting in the time and energy. Mm -hmm. And it's good. I think in the end, everybody's voice needs to be heard. And debates and discussions need to happen between opposing sides. But I think, you know, what also speaks measures is where are you coming from? Mm -hmm. you know, what is your background? What are you doing? What are you not doing? Mm -hmm. And I think elections is it's tricky. Um, you know, we want everybody to participate. But I think it's also just as important to really hit. But it's I think even more important to to be uh, to what's the word? It's not just about us having an opinion. <laughs> I think uh, as uh, decolonizing people, we have to practice humility, and that means listening to one another and listening to each other's struggles. Mm. I'd agree with that. Um. Do you mind, Joe? Do you have anything you want to add? Yes. Um, as far as what I'm doing with this election, I've been campaigning a lot for um, measures uh, W and X. I've been working a lot on those campaigns. I've um, been helping getting together um, some phone bankers for that. I've also been phone banking for uh, Proposition 10. And um, I've been getting uh, as many of the community members as I can together as possible, trying to tell people get out the vote. Um been uh, text banking as well, t reminding people, hey, we have an election coming up. I've been hearing, actually, that voter participation in this election is going way up. Um, I've heard in places like Texas right now, right now, Texas, you'll be glad to hear that the um, they've had more people vote early voting than they had people even vote in the 2014 midterm election. Wow. Already. And uh, they're expecting this maybe to have more um, people voting in any than any midterm election in history, and maybe even any election in history. Wow. Um, there, they may even get up to seventy percent voter turnout, crossing fingers. So hopefully, people people really want to get involved. Part of that is the person we have as president now. A lot of people don't like him, mm -hmm. and a lot of people really do like him. So President Chito face. President Chito face. Um, 
but we really need to be involved more than just election season. We need to get people involved every day that they possibly can, mm-hmm. and not just voting. And and if you choose not to vote, you have to have a damn good reason to choose not to vote, and you have to be able to fight in some other way. Mm-hmm. And then, Mary, do you want me to repeat the question, or you're ready to go? No, I'm ready to go. Go call. So what I've been doing in the community, um, of course, supporting many of the great folks who are doing organizing work around specific campaigns like Prop 10, Measure X, you know, Mm -hmm. um, helping them access students for volunteers, helping them access community spaces so that they can phone bank from without being charged some outrageous rates. Um, And... The thing that I really, the message I really want to give to community members, residents, and voters is to really do your research and pay attention to the money. Like, I really feel like the money is the clearest indicator of when something is wrong for the community. And you don't have to look very deeply to see it. And I'll give you an example. We talked about uh, Proposition 8, right? And, and I'm saying I'm supporting Proposition 8 because I believe that the corporations who are dealing with dialysis, you know, are making huge profits and it's not, their profits are not being invested in, in patient care or in their staffing or in training or in any of the things that need to happen so that dialysis patients can have the quality care that they deserve. Mm-hmm. And the fear tactic of getting dialysis patients afraid that they're going to close their clinics Mm -hmm. is very like, it's like tantamount to me. And this might be extreme, but it reminds me of like the Holocaust. Like it's such a fear mongering attitude about it. That is like, you know, literally like if you let this happen, you know, this is like, like the way they talked about, like, you know, the Jewish folks, you know, Mm -hmm. and they were just like, you know, they're taking over everything, you know, they're going to, you know, they're everything that's wrong with society, everything that's wrong with the country. They're going to, you know, take all the jobs, eat all the food, you know, bring all this, you know, like pestilence mm-hmm. and just like the, 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 the fear mongering was so extreme mm-hmm. that people just went along with it and didn't really like stop for a minute to think about, like, is this even true? And we see it today in the immigrant justice movement, Mm -hmm. the Mm fear-mongering around immigrants, and, you know, the immigrants are rapists, and they're drug users, and they're coming here from the cartels, and it's just like, fear, 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 fear. fear. refugees as well. Yes, and it's just, but those are just two examples of when fear-mongering is used as a tactic. Yes. And I think, you know, we have to understand that whenever someone's investing that much in fear, something's wrong. Because nobody should be that vested in us being afraid. Right. right. And so in the Prop 8 campaign, both the pro and the opposing together Mm -hmm. spent $129 million. Wow. $129 million. How much of that was people opposing Prop 8, the opposition that's funded by these corporations, Mm -hmm. these dialysis corporations? Mm -hmm. $111 million of the $129 million was the PACs that are making a profit off these dialysis patients. Wow. And I think people need to see that. Like they need to really think about that. $111 million is a ton of money. So again, the profit they're making must be way beyond $111 million. Right. And for them to be able to just spend that kind of money like that to kill this proposition. Right. That tells me it's the same villain. That tells me that, you know, $111 million, you know how much we could do with $111 million for this community if we invested it in education, if we invested it in mental health services, if we invested it in low-income housing, if we invested it in drug rehabilitation, like all those things, we could spend that money and fix so many things that are wrong with our Mm -hmm. community. When people don't want to direct that money towards the community, but they want to direct it towards political campaigns and mailers and uh, m- ensuring that they keep a profit, you know, and, and this piece of legislation is to cap their profit at 115%. Mm. So it's not saying that you don't get a profit. It's saying you can't be like making 200% profit mm. off the backs of 
folks who are in dialysis and vulnerable and probably have to be on dialysis for the rest of their lives. Right. Right. I mean, it's saying that you can't make a profit off of off of doing something that is supposed to be serving the greater good of the community. Right. Just like we're not supposed to let police do that. We're not supposed to let fire do that. We're not supposed to let educators do mm-hmm. that. We shouldn't be having medical professionals or medical clinics make extreme amounts of profits right. off of basic care for, for humans, for mm-hmm. humanity. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that's the bottom line. So I'm using that as a really vivid example, but I think it applies to all the propositions, right? Yeah. Look at the pack. If you see an absorbent amount of money being spent on one side or the other, ask yourself why. And and if you see that there's corporations in the mix, that should be a red flag right away. Great argument for money out of politics. Oh, right. yes. That's another podcast. We should invite the 28ers. Shout out to the 28ers mm-hmm. to come talk about uh, constitutional amendments to take money out of politics. And also another conversation for our future podcast is genocide. And yes. how the fact that this fear mongering is part of uh, the dehumanizing process um, that is being used today, like Mary said, for so many different people, whether it's uh, trans folk, trans folk, black folk, uh, migrants coming uh, that are traveling to the Turtle Island, to the Americas, whether it's refugees, refugees from uh, Middle Eastern countries. When you look Jews. at when you look at who. Uh, is being dehumanized. I, I use the word dehumanized because it is part of a larger conversation of genocide. And dehumanized, dehumanization is stage four when it comes to uh, genocide. And that's a larger conversation for, I think, another podcast. Yes. yes. So um, it's about that time to wrap it up. So I do want to thank my guest today, Miss Mary V, <laughs> Jason M, and Joe C. Um, do you all have any plugs that you'd like to throw out? Yes, I want to thank all the folks who've been supporting local Deal de los Muertos events all over the region. Uh, we promoted four specific events at Cal State San Bernardino, San Bernardino Valley College, uh, and we recently did one yesterday at Casablanca in Riverside. Um, the last one is going to be tomorrow, which is Sunday, the 4th of November. And that will be in Redlands at the Olive Avenue Market. It's a beautiful uh, De Los Muertos celebration that they put on. Very culturally respectful, very uh, local, with local vendors and local dollars staying in our community. And I would uh, want to just give a shout out to all those local folks who've been doing hosting those events and, and talking about a very difficult thing for, for a lot of people, which is grief. And, and how do we change the mindset about how we deal with grief? And, uh, you know, how do we do it in a more, again, decolonized, indigenous way, yes. which is celebrate our ancestors. And um, so uh, I really encourage folks to come out to that. I also want to let folks know that we are going to uh, be supporting a march that's going to be happening in San Bernardino on Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m. Um, and that's going to be down at the Civic Center in San Bernardino. It's a, a march against fascism. And so all these issues that we're talking about, we, we're, we're, we're fighting against fascism with the folks from Refuse Fascism, and we want to, uh, to support them and let the community know to come out and, and, and be a part of a, an action. If you are not down for voting, if you are saying you're not going to vote on Tuesday, then I expect your ass to be at that march on Wednesday supporting direct action because you don't get to just do nothing. You get to either contribute to the solution through diversity of tactics, which can be a march or or something else. But you can get to vote. You get to do both if you want, like I do both or, uh, you know, find some other way to contribute to the solution. And if you're just sitting at home complaining about how terrible the community is, how everything's wrong with the government, how everything's wrong with the system, but you're not doing anything to help organize community or help support those people who are organizing community, then you need to get up and you need to come help. And for folks who have different ability issues, that also includes like, you know, getting on social media and helping us spread the word about the events that are coming up and helping us listen to this podcast and sharing it with someone so someone else can have that information. So I know not everybody can physically come out because of limitations, but everybody can support and that's what we need. Jason, how about yourself? Um, 
So um, I want to do a shout out to uh, to all the brown, black, and LGBTQ folk who have been coming around the Chica space, uh, who have been putting in the mm-hmm. good work. Um, this this space has a lot of uh, it's beautiful the amount of community that's coming out here and the amount of people that are putting in work inside and outside of the space. Um, also, shout, shout out in terms of the Dia de los Muertos, and even more so than that, uh, the, uh, our community who's actively working on decolonization and all the groups that have been a part of it, from Cosmic Force becoming a voice for the youth of color, for uh, decolonizing youth of color out here in SoCal, um, and uh, for the Dia de los Muertos events, all the different groups that are putting in works from the, in, the New Inland Empire Brown Berets to different groups in general that are just doing that as well. Um, I also want to like give a shout out or like a heads up, you know, recently uh, somebody passed away in our, uh, in our life that uh, knew, we've known in our, some of our circles. Uh, her name was, went by Jessica Orozco. Uh, and although some of us only knew her for a short time or had, you know, a short conversation with her, as in, you know, she made a very lasting impression, and it goes to a bigger conversation of uh, the senseless violence that's going on in their communities, as well as conversation about murdered and missing indigenous women. And right now, as we are in um, the times of Dia de los Muertos, it is in order for us to celebrate life, we must celebrate death and understand the reciprocation that that goes between both of these uh, 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 concepts, and um, you know, let's honor the good memories and the love we have for one another, and while honoring our ancestors that have passed on to the next life. Oh, um, oh, and Joe. Yes, I'd like to just uh, remind everyone that um, we're having some. Uh, Christmas stuff coming up, and to look at uh, San Bernardino Valley College's uh, calendar. Um, San Bernardino Valley College will be presenting um, all the night visitors. I do not have the um, dates right in front of me, but you can look at San Bernardino Valley College's website. The, the date should be on there. The music department will be presenting that. Uh, so I wanted to say uh, rest in peace to my friend Richard Sanchez, who was murdered recently. Um, I knew him since he was 10 years old. He left behind a young son and an unborn child. So um, may um, he rest in peace and may he um, go into the next life um, and may he receive peace in the next world. Thank you very much. Thank you. And lastly, for myself, um, tomorrow um, at the Universal Unitarian Church of Riverside, we will be having a Dia de los Muertos service there that's hosted by um, our church member, Mr. Marie Burns Holzer. Mm-hmm. Um, she is a newer member to our church, but she's amazing. She's bringing up some strong cultural topics that are very near and dear to her heart. Um, going forward or looking forward into our future, um, the church is doing a lot more right now where we're, we're really tapping into our culture and we're making some changes. So we just want to thank everyone for tuning in today to listen to this topic. Um, This is something so important. And and like everyone said, you know, if you're not going to vote, do something, you know, be active in some way, Um, show some type of support. Um, So until we see you all again, this has been Opportunity Knox. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your week. See you next time. Bye.